Hello, friends. It is a really great pleasure to be here with you in March 2022 in the 31st season of the New York Review of Science Fiction Reading Series. I'm Amy Goldschlager, a former curator of the series and your host for this evening. And this is a really special event for me personally. It is literally 25 years in the making. And uh, before we get started on all of that, I do have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, the April reading, which we have just scheduled for April 5th, will be Robert uh, V.S. Reddick, and we're very excited about that. He is a great reader if you've never heard him, so you should all be sure to tune in next month as well. Uh, second of all, I just want to make sure that we all know who is responsible for this series, and that is producer Jim Freund. And of course, tonight's audience wrangler, his partner, Barbara Krasnoff, thanks to both of them. Uh, I will just remind everybody that, of course, uh, this reading is not free. We pay for the streaming service. So uh, Jim will be putting a crawl on there for his PayPal and any donations which you feel that you can give will be gratefully received, but no pressure. We all know that uh, we creative types are not always in funds, but pay if you can, because that helps, uh, you know, keep all of us together. Uh, before, oh, the next thing I ought to mention, which I will probably also be mentioning later for people who tune in after that, uh, we will actually be doing a giveaway for this evening's reading of The Circus Infinite, which uh, is published by Angry Robot and comes out in exactly one week. We will be giving out uh, five copies and all you have to do is send out an email to the producer of this series, uh, Jim Freund, and that is J-F-R-E-U-N-D at ourwolf.com and put Circus Infinite in the subject line and we will randomly choose five people for this giveaway. Oh, and one other thing that I would like to mention that uh, Jim is of course also the host of the long running radio series, Hour of the Wolf, which is on WBAI. And the show has actually recently moved. They're trying a new arts block on the radio station. And so now it's on Mondays at 9 p.m. So it will also be available to stream later on the WBAI site, but it would be wonderful if all of you would tune in and uh, give Jim the listenership that he so richly deserves. He always has wonderful guests. And uh, I, think that would, I think that's pretty much it for that. So uh, on to the reading. Uh, early on, I said this was an event 25 years in the making, and I was absolutely serious about it. This reading is actually very important to me personally. Uh, 25 years ago, I was an editorial assistant at Avon Books, and I was going through manuscripts and hoping to acquire things. And although I, I wasn't an acquiring editor for very long, so there are certain proposals which never got to happen, which have stuck with me for absolutely forever. Uh, first, uh, there is a Rachel Pollock novel that would never happen about a romance between Greta Garbo and Amelia Earhart and a Greg Frost novel, I think that was about a floating school. But in this particular case, uh, there was another novel, uh, well, it was a section of a novel from an author and his name was Khan Wong and I really loved it. And we went back and forth three or four times and we tried really, really, really hard to make it work. And we just couldn't. It was, there was different versions of this story of this lonely psychic who pretty much didn't have a friend in the world, who was wandering through this incredibly repressive dystopia and who had powers of some kind and didn't want to be exploited and just was really looking for love and friendship. 
And, you know, there were sort of versions that I think well, there were fairies and I think there were parallel universes. And we went back and forth and it just couldn't happen. I left Avon and I went on to do various things. And I didn't hear from Khan for years, of course, but because my name is a rather unique name, he managed to find me on Facebook in 2017. And he told me, oh, you know, after that, I didn't, uh, I dropped the manuscript. I had a great career in nonprofit arts, but now I'm ready to pick up the manuscript again and revise it. And so I thought that was wonderful. And then I didn't think about it for a while. And then literally, what, uh, less than two months ago, uh, Khan started following me on Twitter. And I went on to my Twitter feed and pinned to his profile was a starred review from Publishers Weekly about his upcoming novel, The Circus Infinite, which comes out in exactly a week. I feel like from what I remember, and we'll talk about that later, the character is very similar, but the plot has completely changed and transmuted into something beautiful and wonderful with lots of circus arts, which is exciting. And I am just really thrilled that this is a thing that's happened and that I can bring Khan Wong to you before anybody else. Uh, because of course, you know, once you have launch week, everybody else gets him, but I got him first. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Khan Wong to you and have him read a selection from his book, after which there will be a Q&A. And uh, you can ask whatever questions that I don't ask. So let me just do the standard thing of reading Khan's bio, and then I will go away. In past chapters of life, Khan Wong has published poetry and played cello in an earnest folk rock duo. As an internationally known hula hoop teacher and performer, and believe me, I'm going to ask about that one, he's toured with a circus, taught workshops all over the world, and produced circus arts shows in San Francisco. He's worked in the nonprofit arts for many years, most recently as an arts funder for a public sector grant making agency. The Circus Infinite is his debut novel. And friends, here is Khan Wang. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing, um, for having me, first of all, and for sharing our, our history together. It has indeed been a, a journey. <laughs> and this is kind of a full circle moment. I, so it's, it's, it feels very special for me to be doing the first reading of this posted by you. It's really cool. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I, I'm going, I have a couple of short sections that I'll share with you from the book. Um, this first, part is uh, right at the start of the book, and it's um, our hero, Jess, ha sorry, something off screen just fell over <laughs> and distracted me. Um, our hero, Jess, has just landed on um, Persephone 9, which is the galaxy's infamous pleasure moon, and he has snuck into a performance of the circus in town, and uh, that's what we're picking up. <clears throat> The crowd thins out after the show, but Jess doesn't move from his spot. He leans casually on the barrier that separates the standing section from the seats, watches as everyone makes their exit, chattering excitedly about the show. A few workers enter the space discreetly, invisible to all but the one looking out for them. They are humans and besans, and they quietly set about their duties, clearing glasses and empty bottles, cleaning the tables from the dinner service, sweeping the floors. The house lights come on and the air of mystery vanishes in sudden brightness. The space becomes not quite garish, but is certainly no longer the magical other world it had just been. Excuse me, he says politely as he can, to the young human woman tossing empty bottles into the receptacle floating behind her. Who would I talk to about getting a job here? She sticks out her lower lip and blows a lock of pink hair out of her face as she continues working. Alea handles house staff, but if you're interested in crew, talk to Quint. Alea's probably gone for the night, but Quint will be backstage somewhere. Big Hydraxian guy. Oh, the juggler? She laughs. 
No, not him. Quint's a big guy. She pauses and looks at him closely, taking in his hair, his eyes. She's trying to piece his heritage together, but says nothing about it. He likes her for that. Big Hydraxian just says, got it. He begins heading down the steps towards the stage. Oh, don't go that way, the bus girl says. You won't get through. Go to the crew door, out into the corridor there. She points to the door he entered by. Go right, it curves around. There's a little alcove with a black door. It's unmarked, but you'll hear people and probably smell the clouds of reef. Thanks, he says, and follows her instructions. An attendant walking the other way steps in his path. The exit is behind you. I'm here to talk to Quint about some possible work. The usher sniffs in response and steps aside. Jess continues down the dim pathway towards the sounds of chatter and laughter. As the girl predicted, the pungent smell of reef fills the air. He follows the sound and the smell and sees a space where the curtains lining the walls are parted. He heads for it, then freezes when a multi-legged form emerges from the shadow. An insectoid being as tall as him steps into the corridor. It walks out on four back legs bearing a long abdomen, and its two front arms, or legs, are bent forward in front of it. Its head is triangular with rounded corners and two long feather-like antennae sprout from the top of its face, wavering slightly. Its large, bulbous, oblong eyes are violet and black, like the rest of its body, and they seem to refract the dim light. A mantidean. Jess has never seen one in person before. The being emits a soft hissing sound, some clicks, then says in nine-speak, they will accept you when you make them float. As creeped out as he is by the large compound eyes gazing at him, Jess can't look away. He feels the alien's attention unpeel him to his very essence, and he finds, disconcertingly, that he wants to be seen. Is he, is he being judged? Jess can't suss this individual, yet feels certain that he is being assessed somehow. He hopes he passes muster. Thank you, he stammers out. He's embarrassed to be so flustered by the, for lack of a better word, alienness of a member species of the Nine Star Congress. But the Mantideans are the most alien of all of them, and he's never met one before. Not that he accepts that as an excuse. Thank you for the advice. My pleasure. It's what I do. My name is Kush Onar, and my pronouns are he, him, after you. The Mantidean says and gives a little bow, gesturing toward the door while emitting soft clicking sounds. Jess pushes the door open, tamps down a feeling of revulsion at all the legs of the creature, person, behind him. He imagines the fine filaments of the front pinchers whispering the air on the back of his neck. He wonders if that's speciesist of him. The room is warmly lit as he enters, and he steps into a haze of reef, chord ash leaf, and incense. To his surprise, nobody really pays him any mind, but he feels the keen attention of the Mantidean behind him. There's not much of the crew left, just a few lingering clowns gathering their things and dashing past him out the door. The trio of Bezin acrobats, triplets it looks like, stands together in a loose cluster, dressed in street clothes, satchels slung over their tiny shoulders, looking ready to go, but in no hurry. They laugh together at some private humor. I thought you left, one of them says to the Mantidean with a look at Jess. Her sisters join her in looking at him, and he susses from them mild curiosity tempered by indifference. I wanted to see how this plays out, the insect person replies. Curious. The space is a mirror of the theater space, minus the stage and seating. It is filled mostly by mats and trampolines and aerial rigs and other equipment. On one of the towers of trusses rising towards the circus top, a bezin male in a safety harness climbs among the lighting instruments. 
At the base of the tower stands the biggest man Jess has ever seen. He must be the big Hydraxian guy. The Hydraxian he saw on stage was tall, but thin and long-limbed, lithe even. But this guy is even taller and all brawn, thick and hefty, corpuscular in his musculature. He gazes attentively up at the bezin in the rafters. Jess finds his concern all the more touching given his bulk. Excuse me, Jess says, modulating his voice to be quiet and respectful, but not timid. Are you Quint? The Hydraxian keeps his eyes on the Bezin, who's still in costume. He must be one of the acrobats. Then glances, then glances down to Jess for a click of a second, then back up to the guy climbing around high above them. Who are you? I'm wanting to ask you about a job. On your crew, maybe? How's it looking up there? Quint calls to the upper reaches of the tent. Almost caught it, comes the distant call back. The hulking, forearmed man turns his attention back to Jess. His brows are thick, his jaw square, and nose broad. Despite his intimidating build, his eyes are kind. What's your name? Jess. Ever crewed before? Can't say that I have. Built stuff? No. Fixed stuff? No. Well, what can you do then? His tone isn't snide or sarcastic. He's genuinely curious. Jess wonders how he should spin his particular set of skills and wishes he had thought a bit more thoroughly before coming back here. Before he can formulate a response, the contortionist aerialist lady walks up. She's draped in a dark red cloak, her lustrous brown hair tied back in a loose ponytail. Her halo, though small, catches and refracts the light just as much as the Asuna on the shuttle. It's a golden amber color with some pale yellow that complements her deep, copper-toned skin. The effect of the shimmer on human skin captivates his gaze. He tries not to stare, but she catches him at it. If she minds, she doesn't say so. Hi, Kushonar, she says to the Mantidean who bows in return, bringing his front arms up in a sort of prayer pose. His movements are graceful, delicate almost. She turns to Jess. I'm Essa. You are? Jess. Jess. If I were to take a guess at your heritage, I would say human and Rajala? Her voice is silky and resonant. You would be correct. That's very unusual. Not any more unusual than human and Asuna. She smiles faintly at this, nods her head toward him. Then she wraps her arms around Quint in an embrace, and her torso looks as thick as one of his legs. He rests one of his hands on her back and smiles down at her fondly. Jess here is asking about a job with the crew, Quint informs her. Oh, really? Essa arches an eyebrow and looks to Jess with fresh interest. What can you do? We were just getting to that when you made your enchanting appearance. Quint rubs his hand on her back, gently, as he speaks. Essa giggles. Flatterer, someone's looking to get lucky tonight. A flush flows between them, one that Jess recognizes instantly. He looks away from the couple and shakes off the echoes of their attraction leaves in him. Quint's suavity impresses and makes for an easier focus than his attraction to his apparent lover. So, Quint begins again, what is it that you... A yelp of alarm from overhead interrupts the conversation. You okay, Bo? Quint calls up. A loud crack sounds through the air, struts high above them, snapping. A wedge of a support beam plummets towards them, cracked off the main structure along with a couple of big lights. Bo, tethered to a strut by his harness, yowls as he falls. Reflexively, Jess reaches up and emits one of his fields. A pale blue bubble of light envelops the falling man and gear, suspending them in the air. Then the crewmen, the broken scaffolding and the lighting instruments, all float gently down at Jess's direction. When everything is safely on the floor, Jess closes his fingers into a fist, and the blue light vanishes, winking out. Bo, Essa, and Quint all stare at him. He can feel the intense looks of the Bezin triplets and the Mantidean burning into the back of his head. 
No use hiding it now. That, Jess says nonchalantly, I can do that. So it, it occurs to me that um, while it occurred to me while I was reading this uh, that I should have prefaced with a little more introduction, uh, namely that there's a lot of aliens in this world and I won't go to all that. Uh, and our protagonist, Jets, uh, is an empath. And the word sus denotes when he's using his empathic ability. So, um, so in case you were confused at some things, I hope that clarifies it. Uh, th that last point is relevant to the next section that I will share with you. And it's a little later on in the book. And um, uh, the manager of the circus has asked Jess to accompany her to a meeting with the local crime boss, who is the uh, quote unquote sponsor of the show. And um, this is the first time that Jess meets uh, the antagonist of the piece. Um, they're in an elevator, and I'll just start in the middle of the elevator ride. <clears throat> the ride. The ride up goes on longer than it seems it should. Alea appears as comfortable in silence as he is. When they finally stop, the doors open to a foyer where a young human woman sits behind a simple glass-topped desk. Her skin tone is of a deep, ruddy hue that is more common to Indran humans, but he can tell she doesn't have the Indran gifts. She's not sussing him back. Ms. Dikwi, she rises from her seat, smooths her skirt as she walks them to the office door. She wears a sleek dress of soft blue material and a matching jacket, standard Rajalan business attire. Please, she continues, opening the door and entering, then stepping aside to let them through. Miss Sequi, an associate, she announces. Thank you, a silky voice says from deeper into the office. The receptionist steps out and closes the door behind her with a soft click. The room smells faintly like fresh carpet and chordash leaf. His father used to complain about the increasing frequency of chordash smoking in business settings. He wouldn't have approved of this environment. Come in, Alea. No need to be shy. They walk deeper into the office toward a desk that sits in front of an arched window overlooking Port Ruby. This curved pane of glass is framed by other windows that are long and rectangular, both of which are open. Curtains flutter in the soft breeze coming through them. The slate gray walls are lined with paintings. Pedestals are dotted about, upon which sit pottery pieces that must be very expensive. Closer to the desk, the walls are lined with sparsely populated shells. Behind the desk is a rajala, a bank of holographic displays glowing in the air in front of him. The fact that he is Rajula is no surprise. It makes sense that the big boss would, would be, or maybe a Lauren human. Both groups have reputations for unscrupulous business practices, after all, to put it mildly. Jess is slightly ashamed at the way he's profiling. He's glad he said nothing aloud. Hello, Nico, Alea says brightly, feigning cheerfulness. This is my secretary, Jess. Nico Dax takes Jess in with a glance. Human and Rajala. Jess nods. Yes, sir. Dax quietly chuckles as he pulls out a sleek silver case from a drawer. He takes out a rolling paper and pinches of shredded purple leaves from within. Humans must be the most prolific cross-species breeders in the universe. Jess is put off by this comment, but also acknowledges the truth of it. He himself had just, moments ago, been profiling in much the same way. This similarity between him and the man behind the desk is discomforting, and he shuffles his weight anxiously. He says nothing, and just watches as Dax methodically rolls himself a smoke. Have a seat, Alea. 
She takes the one chair available, just stands behind her slightly to the side. Dax puts the smoke to his lips and lights it, filling the air with sweetness. Jess susses him, and the overall impression is not so different from the Rigela that surrounded him back home. No, not home, just back where he came from. There's a formality, an almost clinical detachment. Alea, on the other hand, comes off so much like a human. If he were to suss her with his eyes closed, he might take her for human. It's no wonder she left the Rigelin expanse. But why did Dax? Jess senses someone firmly in control of his emotions, highly intelligent and somewhat cold. How can I be of service, Alea asks. Please, Alea, we've known each other for a long time. No need for obsequiousness. Well, what do you want seemed a little too forthright. Good, she's relaxing. Nico takes another remarkably graceful drag of his cigarette. He is fine-featured with high cheekbones and a sharp nose and a thin mouth. His eyes are deep blue, a vivid, dark shade that is unique to Rigela, though the silver hue of Jess's own eyes, or Alea's, is more common. Dax's eyes look like sapphires set into his pale blue skin. The Cirque Cosmica has done quite well over the years, he says. It's been a good investment, mostly. Yes, we're all very proud of what we've created. It's really given the Luna Lux that extra little spark, something more elevated than the strippers and cheesy bands out there. He waves a hand dismissively at the window behind him. And all thanks to your vision, I commend you for that, Alea. Alea smiles, gives a small nod. Jess senses her nervousness rise again. She's waiting for the other shoe to drop. He turns his sense towards Nico, but finds it hard to get a read on him. But you and your merry little band of misfit of misfits have been at it for a while, and revenues are starting to slip. We're planning to full houses, but not sold out, not anymore. No more waiting lists, and six shows a week instead of eight. We couldn't keep up that pace, Alea protests, her nervous energy dissipating and giving way to indignation. The performers need rest. It's very strenuous on them what they do. Then recruit some more. Bez is crawling with circus folk. Indra is full of musicians and performers. Besides, the show needs freshening up, Alea. It's getting stale. Adding that Mantidean was a nice touch, I give you that. An intriguing side attraction. But I want more. His voice is smooth, lulling even, but Jess senses the impatience beneath the building threat. I have another associate who has quite a successful production on Bez. Some similar acts to what you present, but they're also doing different things. Sexy girls and big bowls of water, a whole group bungeeing from the top of the theater. That show tells a story. Where's your story, Alea? Well, it's, that show has fire too. Literally, people dancing with fire. I want fire, Alea. Where's your fire? Alea is bewildered. I, we can do that. Had I but known you were unsatisfied, well, consider this your notice. My associate has made a proposal to bring his show to Port Ruby. I don't think this town needs two circuses, especially since the one that's here isn't even selling out anymore. Just tenses. The man has already come to a had already come to a decision before he called her here. I'll give you the next quarter, Alea. Zhuzh it up. I want sold out houses again. I want demand so great you must turn people away at the door. That's what I need to see. He stubs his smoke out on a glass dish on his desk. Got it? Yes, Alea says, forcing stillness to her voice. I understand. And I'll need another 10% of the proceeds to make up for the lost revenue. It's obvious Nico doesn't need more money, and he smiles as he tightens the screws. That will make it hard on the staff, Alea pleads. 
And to make the changes you're asking for, we'll need some new acts. We'll cut some of the old ones then. Do you really need all those clowns? They're acrobats too. I don't care how you make it happen. He holds his hands up, casting an unquestionable, apathetic air. Just do it. For the first time, there's a discernible edge in his voice that makes Jess's stomach clench. Don't cut the Asuna half-breed, though, Nico adds. Keep that one around. I, I understand. Very good. He spins around in his chair, turning his back to them, a blatant dismissal. Then, as an afterthought, he adds, do give my regards to your sister. He doesn't turn around when he says this, just looks out the window, surveying his realm. Alea stands, meets Jess's eyes, and begins heading for the door. They make a hasty exit, and the receptionist smiles without saying anything. Once the doors close, Jess asks about Alea's sister. They were lovers once, she and Dax. My sister had the audacity to bring it off, a risky move, considering. She brushes it away, not wanting to discuss details. What else did you pick up? He's having fun with this challenge, and he likes power tripping. That's not a surprise, I guess. He's pretty much made up his mind about the other circus, but there's a part of him that wants to be surprised. He wants to be impressed. But there was something else. He's not being as rational as he pretends. I sussed a kind of vindictiveness. This quarter he's giving us is really just a courtesy. She huffs at this. We'll have to really razzle-dazzle him then with acts and with profit. So much so he can't deny us. I don't know how we'll manage the extra 10% though. The margin is so tight as it is. That was just petty. He's toying with you for amusement. Alea laughs, a humorless laugh. You're right, it is petty. He didn't need to make that, this even harder. I noticed something though, just now. What's that? You said this quarter he's giving us. Just senses Alea is touched, and he's not sure he can take it. His face flushes hot. I guess I did. She smiles again and says nothing more. So that's what I've got for you today. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Khan. Thank you. And uh, for those the people who joined us late and for those people who are streaming this later, if you want more, A, you should pre-order Khan's book from Angry Robot. But we're also giving away five copies. If you send an email to jfreund at ourwolf.com with uh, Circus Infinite in the subject line and you do this before Sunday evening, you will have an opportunity to partake of this giveaway and get one of five copies. So uh, that will probably be an ebook, by the way, because, you know, these days shipping tricky. So uh, anyway, thank you so much. And now we're going to segue into our Q&A. And people who want to ask questions, please do. But of course, I have my own questions. And I know some people are probably going to ask you the same questions over and over. And you're going to get tired. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start by asking the question that really only I can ask. And I've just been really curious. How did we get from the drafts that we have that I kind of sort of remember 25 years ago from today. Because if I remember correctly, it was a very repressive dystopian earth. And there were a bunch of different things that Jess could maybe do. I don't think the gravity thing was in there. I think there was seeing fairies possibly. And I think there was something about parallel universes. Yeah. But I don't remember what else. How did you get <laughs> from there to here? Uh, well, first of all, that was a different, it was a different protagonist. Um, I mean, kind of a version of the same person, but really a different protagonist. So when I had contacted you in 2017, um, saying that, oh, something clicked in my head and I'm rewriting this book. I, I did, in fact, rewrite the book. Um, but 
working off of a version of that same kind of dystopian thing that you had previously read. And, um, and you know, that draft served to kind of just get it out of my system. Um, but I, I kind of felt like it wasn't working. But then I took another run at it and decided to not to no longer set it on Earth. And it was um, and it was on this other world, uh, Indra, that humans had settled after fleeing a devastated Earth, you know, after they killed the planet. Um, and it ends, that version of the story ended with the with humans being invited to join this alliance of worlds and again that version of the book was also set aside but this alliance of worlds kind of was intriguing to me um that you know that i arrived at at the end of the second rewrite of the book that you saw 25 years ago um and so i kind of developed that out further and thought it was an intriguing world and wanted to have a story in it. Um, but I, I wasn't sure what the story would be. Um, but And for a long time on kind of my writer bucket list was to write a circus book. And, but I had always thought that it would be an earthbound circus book, you know, um, like a Ring and Brothers or Cirque du Soleil kind of thing. Um, but, and then Alien Circus clicked. And and then that's how we got here. <laughs> uh, Jim Ryan was wondering if there was a particular circus you had in mind as you wrote it. And I'm just in general curious how your experiences in the circus arts fed into how you created the circus. Um, well, I really, I mean, I, I think it's, pretty clear I drew a lot of inspiration from Cirque du Soleil, um, at least from the, what the sh what's in the show, um, with, the, except with the addition of like alien creatures and like people who can do other things um, that humans can't. Um, and, but as, as far as my personal experience with, with performing and, and being a part of a circus for a brief time, I mean, that certainly informed like the backstage scenes, um, the bits about where they're having to revamp the show and coming up with different ideas, uh, you know, brainstorming new acts, rehearsing their acts, um, the backstage banter, the pre-show jitters, like all that kind of stuff uh, came from my direct experience of, of being a part of that world for a time. And how does the hula hoop expertise feed into it all? <laughs> well, I mean, that was part of that. That was part of you know being, um, you know, being a performer and everything. So it's it's kind of part and parcel of the same, of the same thing, really. So yeah. Okay. Um, I did also want to ask something about um, the style, which. You're doing something interesting, which I think is going to spread. I have noticed it's something that uh, Charlie Jane Anders does in her book, uh, Victories uh, Greater Than Death. Mm -hmm. And um, KM Sparza kind of does at least somewhat in First Become Ashes. And that's just constructing as part of the dialogue, um, introducing pronouns, which I don't necessarily think was part of prose. I mean, the other thing too, which I kind of think is, somewhat related, but maybe not quite, is the importance of consent and asking people how they want to be touched. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and why those things were important to you to incorporate in the book. Sure. Um, I'll, well, I'll start with the pronouns one first. Um, I mean, part of it is just wanting to normalize the sharing of pronouns. Um, and I kind of feel like, I mean, I, there's, you know, disparate opinions about, um, about whether it's appropriate and people, whether cis people should do it. Um, my feeling is that everybody, it, 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 
it becoming habit and custom for everyone to share their pronouns and um, normalizes that and really takes the pressure off of um, trans and gender non-conforming folks. Um, I mean, because if it's a world where only trans and gender non-conforming folks share their pronouns, I, I, I feel like it, 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 it puts too much too much pressure and perhaps negative attention. Whereas if it's something that everybody does, then it's just something that everybody does and whatever. Um, yeah, so that's that's my approach to it um, in my personal life. In the book, um, it's really only the Mantideans who do it. And, um, and it hadn't occurred to me, honestly, um, for anybody to share their, their pronouns at first. Um, but the Mantideans, this story doesn't super get into that, but it's alluded to a little bit. Um, the Mantideans are the only non-humanoid species that we meet in this story. And th their whole culture and biology, including gender, uh, is very mysterious <laughs> to the humanoid aliens. Um, and so them introducing themselves with their with their pronouns kind of stemmed from that and really more from their alienness than from their gender identity necessarily um so so i wanted to show that sharing of, of pronouns um in this context is kind of more of a cultural thing um and then what was the other oh the consent consent yeah yeah um well so jess is um asexual and sex repulsed um and and i wanted to um i don't know i'm not sure what the word is but like de depict a world where um where asking for consent is just a normal part of interaction with with people and especially um because because he's ace and he's sex repulsed and he's hiding out in this place that is really overtly sexual and very lustful um but i also didn't want i mean just as you we see in flashbacks and stuff has had a rough time of it um but i didn't want to inflict more trauma upon him um, in the present tense story, at, at, at least not from the people that are his friends and his community. Um, and so I really want to juxtapose, this is how one gets treated in a community that's supportive and respectful versus how he gets treated by um, the antagonists of the piece that are not that was the opposite of that so and and gives him a chance to uh express his pan romantic uh aspect of his nature as well yeah. yes, even exactly. if even if he's ace um, yeah. it, and i i just i thought it was very interesting that it was front and center because i, I kind of contrasted to say what uh nicole corner stace is doing in firebreak but her character is ace and arrow and she actually doesn't ever say that in the book. And she's been talking about this rather a lot on mm. Twitter, where she was like, you know, isn't it okay to have a book that doesn't have romance in it and just have good friends? And should you have to actually overtly say so? Um, I don't know. I like to think, I mean, I, I'd like to think that we'll reach a point where people will be able to draw conclusions by themselves. Uh, but I do actually think that it probably makes more sense to tell people at this point, because I feel like we're still, uh, you know, moving along a path where, where people understand who everybody is and how they <laughs> exist in the world. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to go back to a question from Jim Freund, the producer of the series. Uh, because he is busy doing engineering stuff, he wanted some specifics on what exactly you did in the circus when you were participating. I was a hula hooper. 
Um, although what I, I mean, I didn't do, the way I hooped was not like um, the more traditional hula hoop act where there's a ton of hoops and you're doing tricks on different parts of your body. Um, I, I treated the hoop more like a dance partner um, and had a more kind of like martial artsy mode of, of moving with it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was my main prop. I mean, I also spun poi, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with that is what, what that is, but it's like when you have two weights on the end of leashes um, uh, and you spin them around to, uh, to, in different patterns. Um, it's a, well, I, I won't go into the history of poi. <laughs> There's kind of a lot to say about that, but I did a couple of, I did a couple of object manipulation props, I, some contact juggling as well. Um, but hoop was my main thing. So, and that's what I um, came to be internet famous for and um, traveled around the world and taught and performed. And when I did do performance, it was doing a hoop routine. That's so cool. So, I mean, I think that explains why you read so well, because you're used to performing in front of an audience already, which is something I think I didn't even take into consideration when I forced you to come read for us. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, over the years um, with leading workshops and teaching and, you know, I, I'm comfortable speaking to people. Um, and of course, I mean, doing a performance is a whole different it's a very different kind of feeling and jitters. But also in my pre previous day job, um, I had to make public presentations quite frequently. So um, so I've just gotten used to a so, like this. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I actually was also interested in this way in which you um, have acted um, funding the arts and, and funding circus arts. Um, what has that work been like? What have, what have you done in that area? Oh, that you know, it's been really rewarding um, work. I, I don't. I, re, I retired from that position just about a year ago. Um, so, in, in fact, I got my offer from Angry Robot Books the day before my last day at work. Wow, <laughs> so it kind of was perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so I, I hadn't planned on doing that line of work. I, I kind of just fell into it you know i started working i had been working at an arts nonprofit. amy at the time you and i first knew each other when we were working on that manuscript and that kind of just led um i mean so when when that whole prospect uh with that book fell apart and then i got dropped by my agent via fax <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah i know i just i just think it's so funny now um but at the time it was devastating. But so at that period of time when all that happened, I was simultaneously offered a salary position with this nonprofit that I was working for. So I just took that as a sign from the universe that that's what I should be doing. Um, and then one thing, you know, one job led to another job, et cetera. And then I eventually ended up being an arts funder. I worked for, um, a program called Grants for the Arts, which is the city and county of San Francisco's municipal arts funding agency. And it funds over 200 arts nonprofits on an annual basis. Um, and so that work entailed a lot of community engagement. It entailed learning about um, a lot of, and, and witnessing a lot of different art forms uh, theater, chamber music, avant-garde music, modern dance, ballet, visual arts, film festivals, literary arts, poetry slams, like all kinds of stuff. Um, so it really put me in touch with the culture that was happening in San Francisco and learning like who all the major players are. And um, yeah, and it, was, and it was super rewarding on that level. Um, the The politics of it, as you can imagine, you know, when you're talking about public dollars and arts got to be pretty contentious sometimes, and I don't miss that part of it really. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know, I mean, that, I just kind of went off on a ramble there, but did that answer 
answer your question. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I mean, at <laughs> least San Francisco at least is a very arts positive kind of city. Yeah. Um, I don't know how easy it is to do that in, in other cities. It sort of depends. I mean, yeah, I guess I guess you're probably competing with other people for everybody's competing for dollars uh, to get their work out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my the, the the program that I worked for was funded by the hotel tax. So there was a stand a kind of set revenue stream that supported it, um, and it I think was a testament to the city leadership at the time that created the program. Um, understanding that culture that of the arts and culture was part of the draw of people wanting to come to San Francisco on vacations or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that was that. Well, um, the other, the other aspect in your bio that I'm going to interrogate and I bet Jim Freund would want to know this one too, which is the earnest folk rock duo. Yeah. <laughs> what was that about? Oh, it was, you know, it wasn't, it was kind of just for fun. We called ourselves filament. It was at, Roughly around the same period as when I was working on a song for the end of the world, which was the you know the novel from so long ago, um, and so I was working at the time um, at a place called the Old Town School of Folk Music that had these open mic nights, and um, I, and I ran the open mic nights, and there was this singer songwriter guy um, named Greg who would come and play. And, um, yeah, you know, standard acoustic guitar, singer songwriter stuff. And, and we got to talking one night and, uh, you know, I was playing cello, I was learning how to play cello at the time. And, you know, during one of our open mic chats, um, I mentioned, no, oh, it'd be fun to play cello with, um, you know, another, another musician and do something that wasn't classical music and blah, blah, And he was like, oh, cello would sound really great with some of my stuff. So then we just started playing together. Um, that's really all there was to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we obviously, like, didn't, you know, become famous or anything. So. <laughs> well, I mean, trying to get famous in folk is, is not uh, <laughs> always, always the easiest thing to do, I think. <laughs> Um, you know, earnest, I, I, I value earnestness, but I don't always, I, I don't always know if the wider world necessarily does. <laughs> no, it seems like not. And, uh, yeah. All right. Audience, do we have any additional questions that we would like to ask uh, Kan Wang? I know Jim Ryan a while back was asking if the uh, circus arts that you were doing uh were, was like plate spinning in any way? No, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> yeah, people, I, though, but yeah, that, that wasn't my bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on. Going once, going, going twice. Uh, are there other people who want to know uh, some new insights into this upcoming book, which is really super good? <laughs> Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Uh, there. Oh, you know what? Barbara has a good question. Um, and you know, the end of the book is, in fact, uh, lends itself to this. Are you planning to continue uh, this universe and and Jess's story as he learns more about his powers? Um, I, I am. Know, <laughs> I, know you can't, I don't want to spoil the book for people, but so you're intending to continue his story. I, I eventually. Um, so I, I do have other stories planned that are set in this universe. Um, you know, we haven't, I don't know how much I can talk about it because we haven't pitched anything to my publisher yet. Um, so yeah, so nothing set in stone. But but the next book I will share is already written. Um, but Jess is not the main character. Um, uh, we I, I do have plans to return to Jess and his story, but not with the immediate follow up. Um, will it be oh. other other characters uh, in the story? Maybe. Yeah. So, all right. So, I, I, mean, I, bet I, I, I bet I can make a guess. I bet I can make a guess as um, to which the, one the, you've the, got. 
the star of the next book, should it happen, is Esme. <laughs> I was right. I knew it. Um, another and person. There's a time like, jump, and it and um, it's a few years after the the events of the Circus Infinite. Let's see, and and let's see. Here is this question from Jonathan Gladstone Gilman: Is Tordash a delivery service for Regelian Pharmaceuticals? <laughs> I don't um, know how we answer that one. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's I, and maybe did not enunciate or didn't come over the mic well, but it's chordash, chor with the H. Yeah. Um, and it's a type of leaf that people in this world smoke. It's basically their version of tobacco. So, but I mean, I would just say in general, you're going to continue to infuse your storytelling with the arts in performance arts in general, that would be fair to say, I think. Yeah, that is a, that is, um, I think, I think that's becoming part of my brand, <laughs> at <laughs> least, at least, at least at this initial phase of my, um, hope to be career. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I love space fantasy and space opera. Um, and I've long wondered or have, long wanted stories that were set in those kinds of worlds, but were about artists and creators and culture makers and not necessarily focused on, um, you know, political leaders and starship crews and war and battles and all of that. So, so I am making an intentional choice to write those kinds of characters. Well, that seems fair to me. <laughs> Um, let's see, is there anybody else who would like to ask, ask questions? Uh, because otherwise, if not, we will probably end up wrapping up soon, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to, to speak and ask questions. I mean, I know, of course, not everyone's been, you know, fortunate enough to actually have a chance to read a book, which as I would like to say again, uh, pubs one week from today. So get your orders in and uh, up to five people listening can get a free copy of The Circus Infinite by sending an email to jfreund at ourwolf.com before Sunday evening and just put Circus Infinite in the subject line. Um, and Jim actually also wanted me to mention that tomorrow at 2 p.m., uh, he will be interviewing uh, author Amy Gretsch for his radio show, Hour of the Wolf. And that will also be live streamed on the Hour of the Wolf page and also on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I support Amy very much because not only is she part of the Army of Amy's, she's also part of the Army of Amy G's and, and I just support her intensely. Uh, but before we wrap up, we do have one more question from Jim Ryan, who is always great at providing questions. Um, is there any particular space opera setting that you identify with? Um, in terms of recent book universes, I'd say Becky Chambers' Wayfarer's World um, feels really comfortable and at home. Um, but of course the Federation, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I kind of feel like you can read this book and tell that <laughs> I'm a trekker, so. <laughs> <clears throat> but not really, well, I mean, a little bit cynical, but not really cynical about yeah. it. I mean, the Federation, the Federation has crime. They just prefer not to talk about it too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, I think then um, we will probably wrap up here. And this was, again, a really, really wonderful experience for me. I'm just, I'm so happy that it clicked for you. It's just, you know, it was one of those things that just was living at the back of my head and driving me nuts. It was like my uh -huh. own personal, you know, creative thing that I was sorry that didn't get completed. 
that's so, I mean, I, that's really sweet to hear. Uh, I mean, I actually wondered over the years, like, does she even remember? <laughs> no, I <laughs> never <laughs> forgot. Like, periodically, it would just, like, come back into the back of my head. They say there's like there's like three of these. There's this. There's a Rachel Pollock book about um, Amelia Earhart and Greta Garbo, who is actually in this version a trans woman. That sounds amazing. I it really was. Want to read I wanted to get the money for it, and you know, Rachel uh, never wrote it. And then there is this Greg Frost story about. Uh, I think it was about like a sort of steampunky like floating school or something like that that was really cool i don't really remember the details but i loved it and then when i was doing children's publishing then kara dalkey was supposed to write another tengu novel for me and that also never happened and it's always bothered me mm. it's just you know i think if you uh read the sandman there's that library where all of the books have never that have never been written Mm -hmm. I'm just really, really glad that this isn't one of them. This is the book that got written. And I just, I think that's really exciting. And I just think that that should provide encouragement for people. You know what? Take a, pick up, pick up that, that thing you, that story idea that you lay aside and look at it again with fresh eyes. Who knows where it's going to go? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh oh. Oh, it's it's inspirational for me personally. So I wanted to thank all of our audience who uh, came and witnessed the stream live tonight and all the people who are watching this in the future and uh, tune in in April, uh, April 5th to hear Robert VS Reddick, who is going to be great as well. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you.